Hi, hello, welcome, or welcome back to the Physionic Podcast. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a doctorate candidate in molecular medicine, and today we're going to be covering fasting, or more specifically, intermittent fasting and its effect on health. Uh, I'm going to be covering a study that looked at intermittent fasting, but there's something unique about this study in a number of different ways, but really more specifically uh, related to weight. So this study actually clamped weight so that the subjects or the participants of the study didn't actually end up losing much weight or not any uh, noticeable amount of weight. And so this study is going to answer essentially, or at least start to offer some answers in regard to can fasting or intermittent fasting without any sort of weight loss have positive effects on our health. So some of those effects that we'll be investigating are like blood pressure, blood sugar, inflammation. That's a big one. I get a lot of heat on my fasting content on inflammation. People don't like it when I when I discuss that, I can tell from my comments that I get on some of my more popular videos on that. Uh, also, insulin sensitivity. And uh, I think maybe like one or two other, cholesterol and triglycerides, those were the other two measures. Uh, so I've been, over the last two and a half months, I've been so focused on keto and its effect on, on health. And I'm going to be finishing up my the last bit of my analyses for that and releasing that over the next few weeks next two weeks or so. But uh, slowly, I'm starting to focus on fasting, intermittent fasting, specifically in the different types of fasting. So with that in mind, that's what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, the study that I'll be covering, if uh, you're watching the podcast, you can see it, is called Early Time Restricted Feeding Improves Insulin Sensitivity, Blood Pressure and Oxidative Stress, Even Without Weight Loss in Men with Prediabetes. So as usual, uh, as, is cust- as is customary with Physionic, uh, we're going to be going into some of the data. I'm going to show you some of the data on the screen if you're watching. Of course, if you're listening, I'm going to be describing everything for thine convenience. And then we're going to discuss it a little bit, and then we're going to put a bow on it with some conclusions and some takeaways. So if you're interested in all of that science, then please stick around and certainly comment below if you have any uh, added thoughts or things that you wish that the study uh, could have investigated better or things that they should have investigated better. Um, but keep in mind, of course, one study is just one study. Uh, it's, they're not going to, we're not going to make these claims that are going to be resolute and stuck and can never be changed. Uh, there, it's just going to be a piece of evidence or a series of pieces of evidence that we can then base things off of and uh, we'll continue to investigate fasting on health as we move forward. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's discuss the study design because we know that that's important. Otherwise, we have no context for our data that we're going to be looking at. So the study design is relatively simple. Uh, They recruited eight men and they had them undergo intermittent fasting, which they call time-restricted feeding. And this intermittent fasting was 18 hours of fasting and six hours of consumption. So pretty close to the common style of 16-8 uh, that a lot of people like to do, 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of consumption. I don't think that we would see any drastic differences between those two, but that's purely speculation on my part. So anyway, six hours of of eating and 18 hours of fasting for these individuals that were part of this study. And they were instructed, they had two things, two primary things that they had to stick to. One, they had to finish eating by 3 p.m. So their last morsel of food that they could consume was by 3 p.m. And they had to have the six hour eating window. So those are two things. Now, it's possible that some people uh, consumed, let's say, at 7 a.m. and then they could eat until 1 p.m. Or some people maybe ate at 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. Uh, so it's there's a little bit of variability there. But generally, the eating, cons- the eating was done in the morning and the early afternoon. And then nothing was consumed uh, in the evening. 
and of course, uh, overnight as they were sleeping. Then the researchers had them stick to this for five weeks. And what I really like about this study is that the researchers actually provided all the values. They weighed out all the food, uh, made sure that everything was as controlled as they could possibly have them without it being what's called a metabolic ward study where the participants have to stay at the lab the entire time, uh, which is really expensive. Uh, it's gives you great information, like the best possible information, but it's also super expensive. You need a lot of manpower or people power. And it's, uh, it, it just takes a lot of resources to do something like that. So they kind of struck a middle ground where they prepared all the foods and they had all these foods for these individuals. And they told them, this is how much you have to eat. And this is how much you have to eat so that you don't lose weight or you don't gain weight. And the individuals then had to just stick to that plan as long as they stuck to, they consumed all their food within that six hour window. Okay, so that was the fasting uh, situation. And they did that for five weeks. Then they had a seven hour washout period where they just went back to their daily lives. They were able to consume whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted, without any sort of supervision from the uh, researchers. And then they went back and they had another five week period where they were on a control diet, which is the exact same foods. The actual foods themselves didn't change, but they were instructed to consume all those foods over three square meals. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, meaning that they were consuming food over a 12 hour period, as opposed to being restricted to the six hour uh, feeding period. All right. So that's essentially it. And then the researchers just took measurements at baseline, but so before each diet started, the control diet or the intermittent fasting diet, and then five weeks later at the end of each diet, and then they were just comparing uh, values uh, from there. So, as I mentioned, I'm throwing something up on the, the screen right now that uh, the everything was by, done by weight maintenance so that the food that they consumed if that was in the control diet or intermittent fasting, it was the same. It's just the, the distance between each meal was drastically shortened for intermittent fasting because they had to fit it all within six hours. And then much, much uh, longer for the control diet because they had their you know breakfast, lunch, and then dinner. And uh, far less time that they were actually fasting in, in that situation. Now, the weight maintenance, I should touch on that real quick because they did both groups, so it's technically one group of men, but both times that they were on their diets, they actually ended up uh, fluctuating. Their weight did fluctuate, I think, one kilogram, so about two pounds, maybe up to three pounds. That's incredibly negligible, and the difference between these two was non-existent. So they fluctuated the same amount between uh, both diets. Okay. And that's, of course, by design, because the participants were told to consume X amount of food so that they would maintain their weight. And if they didn't, if they started to decrease their weight or something, then the researchers would adjust their, their consumption to eat a little bit more. So that's what's really intriguing about this is the fact that now we're going to, whatever data I'm about to tell you about, whatever data that we're about to show is by function of intermittent fasting. It's by function of these 18 hours of fasting by comparison to a regular controlled uh, diet of the, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, not by the loss of weight or the differences in their diet composition. Okay, so the first thing, let's touch on this, the, the blood sugar levels, insulin levels, and the third thing well, what we're going to go ahead and knock out as well is the insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance, either way. So here, and whenever I'm saying here, for anyone listening, uh, I'm going to be describing everything as I mentioned, but uh, we've got the blood sugar levels. So the blood sugar levels actually were not different uh, between the two groups. And this is, again, after five weeks being on each diet. So a decent amount of time and definitely enough time, I would say, I would venture to say that uh, that's enough time to see some sort of an effect, and yet we don't see an effect. And 
If you're not familiar with statistics, then uh, you may think that maybe the intermittent fasting group uh, may be different from the control group, but uh, it turns out that statistically, when you actually run the analysis, uh, there is no difference between these two. Uh, however, when looking at insulin levels, the reduction in insulin was apparent for the intermittent fasting group. So there was a statistically significant reduction in insulin, in blood insulin levels, compared to uh, the control diet. Now, this might imply, and I've said this before in other content, that if blood sugar doesn't change, but insulin levels drop, then this would imply that there may be an improvement in insulin sensitivity because you have less insulin molecules present to shuttle the same amount of blood sugar out of the bloodstream into your cells. This means that the cells then are more insulin sensitive because it takes less of it to activate those cells. That's a very broad way of explaining that. And granted, as far as I remember, the statistics, they, they didn't actually compare them. Uh, they only compared between the two groups. Uh, as far as I know, they didn't compare the before versus the after of each diet. So before being on the intermittent fasting diet versus after being on the inter intermittent fasting diet. So they're really just comparing between the two. So it is possible that in both diets, they saw a slight decrease in blood sugar, but there was no difference between the two diets. Okay, so that's taking the blood sugar levels and the, the insulin levels into consideration. Insulin does decrease uh, far more significantly in the intermittent fasting diet. However, we don't have to just speculate. We the, the, the researchers can actually test this themselves, and they end up doing that exactly. So they end up looking at beta cell responsiveness, and beta cells are uh, a patchwork of cells that are found in your pancreas, and those are actually the ones that secrete insulin. So uh, the more responsive that they are, then presumably they would be able to release uh, insulin more easily. And that's what they ended up finding, so that the intermittent fasting group did experience an improvement in beta cell responsiveness. Now, by another measure of insulin sensitivity, or the opposite, insulin resistance, they found that insulin resistance, or the lack of sensitivity, as another way of putting it, uh, was improved by intermittent fasting. So here again, we, we find evidence that which corroborates this up here uh, with the, uh, the blood insulin levels as well as uh, beta cell responsiveness. So three pieces of data here that show that, uh, insulin, that intermittent fasting improves insulin sensitivity and uh, really through beta cell responsiveness, as, which is also indicated by the uh, insulin levels. So great news. And that's, uh, that's all from intermittent fasting for uh, 18 hours. Okay, so now let's look at the blood pressure levels. So systolic bl blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure, if you go to your doctor and they, they take a measurement uh, of your arm, or really anyway, so they can also do it by your calf. And there are a number of different ways to do it, but usually it's by your arm. Uh, the systolic blood pressure is the highest level of pressure that's found in your arteries. And that's the top number. That's the high number that you, you experience or that you see when they, they report back. And the diastolic is the lowest level of pressure uh, in your arteries. So they're the two complete opposite ends of the spectrum of your blood pressure. So systolic, the high number, uh, was actually changed by intermittent fasting. It was reduced and actually, you know, pretty significantly, maybe like seven uh, millimeters of mercury uh, by comparison. So that's, you know, that's, that's pretty good, uh, especially if you're not dropping any substantial body weight. So intermittent fasting seemed to have an effect in, in that regard. So that's for the systolic. Now diastolic, same thing. Uh, there was a statistically significant uh, difference. Now, it's always difficult with this kind of uh, research because uh, with the control diet, there was an increase in diastolic blood pressure. And although there was a decrease in it with the intermittent fasting group, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's only because of the decrease in intermittent fasting. It's really just measuring the change overall. So this increase with the control diet 
as well tacked onto the decrease by intermittent fasting. So if the control diet had seen no change, it's possible that uh, there may have not been a change for for diastolic with intermittent fasting. But as it stands, uh, intermittent fasting seems to have a protective effect and reduces blood pressure all the way around if that's uh, systolic or diastolic. Really cool, really cool information there. All right, let's move on to cholesterol and triglycerides. So uh, this is total cholesterol. I, I'll be telling you about LDL and HDL, but uh, this is, I'm just going to be showing you the, the uh, total cholesterol levels. Let me quick scroll down with my notes here. Yes, perfect. Okay, so with total cholesterol, what they found is something that uh, is a bit mind-boggling and uh, counterintuitive, but they actually ended up finding that the control diet reduced total cholesterol significantly, but the intermittent fasting didn't seem to have much of an effect. So it seems like, at least based off of this data, that total cholesterol was reduced only in the, to in the control diet, or at the very least was not changed uh, in the intermittent fasting group. So it seems to point more towards the control diet. And that's likely because they're changing in the composition of the, their actual diet. They're going from a crappy diet to a, uh, or a potentially crappy diet to a better diet. But most likely if people are pre-diabetic, then they're pro not to definitively say it, but usually that's because a person doesn't have the greatest diet, especially if they're overweight. So, that that's intriguing information, but actually the looking at the LDL and HDL levels, so low density lipoprotein, which is part of total cholesterol and high density lipoprotein, which is part of total cholesterol. Uh, those actually were not different between the control diet and the intermittent fasting uh, diet or protocol, I guess I should call it. As for triglycerides, there was <clears throat> maybe a small reduction in the control diet, but uh, there was a increase, a rather substantial increase in triglycerides or blood fats with the intermittent fasting group. So this means that intermittent fasting likely increases triglycerides. Is that a huge shock, however? Well, not really, uh, in, in my estimation, and because... When you're fasting, you have to have the release of more fats. Now, that can come out as NIFAs, so non-esterified fatty acids, or they can come as bound triglycerides. So these NIFAs can also be bound to a glycerol backbone, making up a triglyceride. So it's not entirely shocking that in a fasting state that you see increases in triglycerides. So I'm not that alarmed by that. It's not any sort of... Uh, that alone would not would not alarm me. But still, some interesting results here. It's not like everything just plummets because of intermittent fasting. Okay, and the final one is to, yes, final one that I have is to look at a few inflammation markers. Now, if I can quick cut to the screen here. I have gotten a substantial heat on one of my videos where I, it's just me on the thumbnail, and it says fasting increases inflammation. People really don't like it when you uh, say anything negative about fasting. And as a matter of fact, the fact that I even showed that cholesterol levels weren't like reduced by a billion percent uh, may have may have triggered some people. But Anyway, from this video, I keep getting comments from people saying like, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. This is BS, like all this different stuff, which is, I mean, people just get angry because it doesn't feed into their own bias. But what I find especially really comical about this is the fact that on that video, fasting increases inflammation. The, the video is explaining how inflammation is a positive in, the, in that context, that fasting is leading to a positive health outcome. And yet people don't even watch the video or they don't understand the video and they just lash out because they think inflammation is bad. It's always bad when I also have content explaining why inflammation is not always bad.
So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because it's, it's something that I've, I've observed uh, a lot recently. So I wouldn't be surprised if somebody got to this point in this video and ended up commenting that uh, you, don't, you don't know that that's, the, the study is flawed. It's paid off by Big Pharma or some BS like that. I, I hear that one a lot, quite a, quite a lot as well. All right, moving on. Back to the data. So here they're measuring two different measures of inflammation. And inflammation defined as uh, the recruitment of immune cells to a particular location or just the, the generation of more immune cells uh, in the body. So the first one is looking at C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein is a molecule that is released by the liver. And that actually leads to the stimulation, or one of its functions, is to lead to the stimulation of interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 is a molecule that recruits or activates uh, immune cells like macrophages and neutrophils. Really, why it's called interleukin is it's between leukins, which is a leukocyte, which is white blood cell. So it's uh, a molecule that interacts with immune cells specifically. So when we look at C-reactive protein, again, released from the liver, uh, we see no difference between the two diets. So intermittent fasting does not seem to have any sort of beneficial uh, role or not even, we don't even need to say beneficial or non-beneficial. We can just say it has no real effect by comparison to the control diet. So no additive effect. Now looking at interleukin-6, there's also no effect. And again, if you're, what, if you're looking at the data, you might think, well, there might be some sort of an effect here. But again, statistically speaking, when comparing these two conditions, intermittent fasting versus control, there's no change or no difference, I should say, in interleukin-6. So according to these markers, that would imply that intermittent fasting does not seem to have uh, an effect on inflammation. Now, that may be in contradiction to what I just said about the last video, right? The fasting increases inflammation. Uh, that was a different type of fasting. And I certainly encourage that you watch it because it's a fascinating uh, potential mechanism where fasting may increase the ability for the body to release fat from the fat cells. Uh, so <laughs> I won't go into it. It, ju it just really makes me chuckle uh, sometimes when people just get so offended uh, when, when you, you say things and they, they don't, they, they just like, they, they don't bother to try to understand uh, the, the science and they just lash out uh, instead. But anyway, so what does this study tell us? What is, you know, why are the results the way that they are? What, what can we take away from all this? Well, we can take away that without any drastic weight loss, that's the biggest part here that I really like is, and the, the with a clamp nutrition where the nutrition is largely the same except for the timing, we see some effects, which is really cool. You got to think that there, there's, there's something going on there. So intermittent fasting devoid of any sort of other, at least major controlling point, seems to have some independent effects. So just fasting, even for that short period of time during the day, uh, seems to have an effect. It lowers blood pressure or it has a, uh, it has a, an effect relative to the control diet for blood pressure. It almost certainly improves insulin sensitivity. Uh, by reducing the amount of blood insulin levels. Uh, it seems to have some kind of confusing effects when it comes to cholesterol, but it does increase triglycerides. And it seems to have no noticeable effect on these different immune-related uh, markers. So I think, I think what we can say is that there's some mild effects of intermittent fasting that I would venture to say are probably far accentuated if a person ends up undergoing weight loss and or changes their nutrition in general. However, even if you just stuck to your nutrition as it is, 
and you implemented intermittent fasting, even if you didn't lose weight, I can't vouch for if you gained weight, but if you, even if you just maintained your weight, that you might see some health benefits from just shifting your nutrition to a smaller eating window. And that's it. Uh, however, I will also add that intermittent fasting has this benefit in that if you were to eat, try to eat all your food in six hours, you probably would lose weight because most people aren't familiar with that. They don't sit there and track their calories and make sure that they consume a certain amount uh, within a six hour period. Something that I do. Uh, so I know that when I, I did this before, when I consumed all of my calories in a six, in an eight hour window, that I still maintained my weight. Um, however, that's really difficult to do. You, I mean, it's, you get full, you get full fast. So uh, if a person doesn't do that, they'll probably still end up losing weight regardless. So there's a double benefit uh, in that regard. But here we're really investigating the uh, weight independent effect. Okay, so hopefully you found this informative. If you did, uh, please consider sharing the video or consider sharing the podcast. Let's speak English, Nick. And uh, if you're not subscribed yet, please uh, please consider that as well because uh, you know I've got a, a lot of uh, a lot of content coming out on fasting. And with that, I hope to have the pleasure of speaking with you in the future. Have a good one. Bye.